Our last speaker you met at the beginning of the day, Dr. James Simon. He now will be talking about medical treatments for sexual dysfunction. Dr. Simon. Thank you very much for that kind introduction and hope everyone is having a great day. It's my task to talk about the medical treatments for sexual dysfunction in women. Doctors Rubin and Kingsburg have been very effective in letting you know that there are many, many treatments for male sexual dysfunction, not so much for women. But I didn't want to leave you with the concept there was nothing that could be done for sexual dysfunction in women. In fact, I'm very encouraged by the availability of some new treatments and increased interest in the scientific community on developing additional treatments for women suffering with different sexual dysfunction. Let's first talk about sexual desire. We often forget when we're talking about female sexual dysfunctions, we often forget about the male partner. And we've often heard, well, all she really needs is a partner transplant. Um, I'm not going to focus on that, but I do want to make sure that we all keep in the back of our minds that a normal, healthy relationship and a normal functioning male partner are critical to good sexual desire in couples. We often say that there are three stages of a man's sexual life. When he is young, he has sex and he has it tri-weekly. When he is middle-aged, we say he has sex and he will try weekly. But unfortunately, when he's older, he may try, but it may be that he tries weekly. And so he may need his own help and his own sexual dysfunction may be part and parcel of their intimacy problems, either primary or secondary, meaning they're the cause of the intimacy problems or the intimacy problems are a cause for his sexual dysfunction. But either way, a functioning partner, uh, if it's a heterosexual partner or a homosexual partner, is critical to a good relationship. Now, everything on this slide is a bit of a lie. I don't like to lie to patients. I don't like to lie to my audiences. But I promise you all of them are almost true. And they're true enough that we should kind of simplistically memorize them. And so I call these the three phases of love. We have a lust phase, we have an attraction phase, and we have an emotional attachment phase. When I spoke to you about the evolution of sex and sexual function, I was mostly talking about the lust phase, a phase dominated by reproductive hormones testosterone, estradiol, and the evolutionary drive to mate and reproduce. But that's very simplistic when we talk, to, talk about sex in humans. And so let's talk about attraction. In the brain, attraction is largely focused on three so-called brain hormones or peptides. These are dopamine, norepinephrine and serotonin. And dopamine and norepinephrine are pro-sexual, meaning the more we have, the more sexual we are. And serotonin is actually antisexual. So drugs that raise serotonin are bad for sex usually. And in the brain, a reduction in serotonin is usually good for sex. So let's talk about each of these in very broad terms. So dopamine is a pleasure hormone. It increases pleasure, euphoria, and because we are motivated by pleasure, yes, I really do want that cheeseburger. It could be 
sexual pleasure also, a good orgasm can be highly motivating in both men and women. Dopamine is a motivating hormone. Norepinephrine is that hormone that is associated with excitement, alertness, attention. It causes your heart to race and your pupils to dilate. It's what gives you the sweaty palms on your hands. And it's what I call the Doberman effect. You've always often seen a Doberman pincher, a dog that is highly alert and seems to be twitchy even at times. And serotonin, well, it helps in the control of body temperature and mood. And we often use words in our language that are in fact related to serotonin. For example, when serotonin goes down, body temperature goes up, and we talk about having the hots for someone. Further, when serotonin goes down, we begin to have more obsessional thinking, like can't get him out of my mind or can't get her off my mind. And pain, when serotonin goes down, we feel less pain. So all of these are associated with beneficial effects in terms of good sex. And then finally, in relationships, the bonding hormone, the trust hormone, the attachment hormone, um, oxytocin is present and released in abundance during orgasm, for example. This causes us to do things and say things following good sex with orgasm that we might not say otherwise. Like maybe even say, I love you, or you are my baby. Well, one thing that's very important during breastfeeding, that the baby is her baby, and that she bonds and attaches with it, usually from birth, but certainly during breastfeeding. What is hypoactive sexual desire disorder, or HSDD? Well, there's no woman that I've ever known, and I've had, mm, I don't know, maybe 40,000 patients in my career. No woman that I've ever known that wanted to have sex all the time. That would be crazy. But, but there are times when women don't want to have sex for a long time and where her absence of interest in sex, even absence of fantasies about sex, absence of fantasies about her fantasy lover are gone. And so HSDD or hypoactive sexual desire disorder is not just a loss of interest in sex, it's a pathological loss of interest in sex that causes distress. So its definition is persistent or recurrent deficiency or absence of sexual thoughts, fantasies, and or desire for sexual activity that lasts more than six months. It turns out if a woman doesn't have any sexual thoughts, fantasies, uh, or, or desire for sex, and if she's in a relationship and that lack of interest is causing distress for her or distress in her relationship, we call that HSDD. Now, that loss of interest and distress can't be accounted for by something clearer. It can't be accounted for by being sick. It can't be accounted for by recently having surgery or taking medications that are known to decrease sexual desire or interest. It's a debilitating condition. It harms relationships. It hurts a woman's self-esteem and confidence. It hurts her self-identity and emotional base. It creates the perception of inadequacy. It can cause her to feel rejected and frustrated, guilty and shameful and isolated. And it 
definitely is known to contribute to divorces, separation, underperformance at work, and clinical depression. So we would like to be able to treat it in those situations where it's not just situational or caused by another medical problem. It's not just a relationship issue. These are the brain scans of women who are healthy on the left and women who have HSDD on the right when they watch sexually explicit erotic videos. And you can see that those brain images are clearly different. Whether the stress on that woman is causing these differences, whether the differences are causing the distress, or likely some combination is not clear. We can see these images even better using a different kind of scanning, which documents a difference in blood flow in women without hypoactive sexual desire disorder, HSDD, or with hypoactive sexual desire disorder. The two sides of the brain are different, right being different from left, but in fact, whether you look on the right or you look on the left, the brains of women with this disorder behave differently than the brains of women without the disorder. Dr. Rubin, I believe, showed you this slide before. And it's an important one because it integrates the hormones that I've spoken about as classic lust-related hormones like testosterone or estradiol at the top. And those hormones of the three phases of love I've just recalled to you, serotonin, dopamine, norepinephrine, et cetera. I've added here arousal and subjective excitement to the circle of desire because it's our interpretation of desire, whether it's exciting or not, that may be just as important as the level of that desire. Why is it that we don't make this diagnosis of HSDD very often? Well, in the past, we didn't have good tools to do so. And in the past, people were pretty reluctant to try and make such a diagnosis because we didn't have any good treatments. But now with treatments, as I'll show you soon, we have a very simple screening test that's been validated and can be used in clinical settings to determine whether a person, in this case, a woman has HSDD and it's called the Decreased Sexual Desire Screener, the DSDS. It consists of only five questions, and the first four are yes and no. In the past, was your level of sexual desire or interest good and satisfying to you? And a woman needs to say yes to that. Has there been a decrease in your level of sexual desire or interest? And the woman has to say yes to that. Are you being bothered by your de decreased level of sexual desire or interest? And she has to say yes to that. And finally, would you like your level of sexual desire or interest to increase? And she has to say yes. Let's imagine a couple where she doesn't really like him anymore. She could say, yes, she had a good level of sexual desire in the past. And yes, her interest in sex has decreased. But she could also say that she's not bothered by it and she doesn't want it fixed. And that would make it not that she has HSDD, but that she has a bad relationship with her current partner. And then finally, question five is an attempt to find all the other things that it is not. Is she abusing drugs or alcohol? Is she breastfeeding? Breastfeeding women, as I showed you, are tired, sleep deprived, they have pain, they have menopausal symptoms, et cetera, et cetera. She is unlikely to be interested in sex, not because she has HSDD, but because she just had a baby and she's breastfeeding her baby. Your partner's sexual problems. 
We've already mentioned that, at least in the context of heterosexual men. And stress or fatigue, these are all things to rule out before making a diagnosis of hypoactive sexual desire disorder. This is a short list of many of those issues of psychiatric conditions and general health, which can affect sexual function. And if they're present, then we need to fix these first before resorting to a diagnosis of HSDD. There are also lots of medications that have an adverse effect on sexual functioning. And we utilize them all the time. Some of the antihistamines, for example, can cause a reduction in sexual interest, and they're over the counter. We have antidepressants that can reduce sexual interest and orgasmic function. It's a damned if you do and damned if you don't situation. For example, depression can cause decrease in sexual desire, but the treatments for depression can also cause a decrease in sexual desire. A careful balancing act. One of the most commonly used prescriptions are oral contraceptives, birth control pills, and they can cause a decrease in mood, a decrease in those testosterone and androstenedione triggers that might be important to sexual interest, and further, they themselves can cause depressed mood, even suicide. So all of these need to be on the no-fly list before we make a diagnosis of HSDD. Dr. Kingsburg, I believe, showed you this slide, slightly modified. But I wanna focus on the middle panel, not talk about psychotherapy, but talk about medications that we have already in our toolbox, which can treat women with hypoactive sexual desire disorder, who have a good relationship, and who have a functional partner. They include bupropion, which is an antidepressant. Yes, an antidepressant. Testosterone, flibanserin, and a melanocortin for dopamine receptor agonist that is called bremelanotide. Bremelanotide. Well, one of my big soapboxes in life is that there are no FDA-approved testosterone products for women, even though women have tons of testosterone, as I've already shown you. And as a result, as far back as 2006 and 2007, there were 2 million prescriptions for testosterone that were actually written for women. 21% of branded testosterone products approved for men were actually written for women, and there are tons of prescriptions for compounded testosterone that are made for women and not counted in those numbers. Recently, however, there have been a number of findings and reviews which show just how important testosterone can be for women's sexual functioning. Going as far back as 1985, low testosterone levels were closely associated with reduced coital activity and loss of sexual desire. Following up on those findings, there was a significant positive relationship between free testosterone and ratings of sexual desire by women in interviews. We've known for many years that there's a decrease in sexual interest or libido that's greater following a woman's oophorectomy, the removal of her ovaries after hysterectomy, than just after hysterectomy alone. And finally, I'd like to point out one of my own studies, the one at the bottom, that shows that as opposed to men, where the more testosterone leads to greater interest in sex and better sexual functioning, in women, there's a sweet spot where up to a certain point, more testosterone is good, but after that sweet spot, too much testosterone is bad and actually has a negative effect on sexual desire and function. We have tons of 
scientific information. Literally thousands of patients who have been studied on testosterone, and testosterone's been documented to show an increase in sexual desire, an increase in arousal, orgasmic function, sexual pleasure, a decrease in sexual concerns, an increase in sexual responsiveness, and an increase in sexual self-image with a decrease in sexually related distress. And this study, the so-called Aphrodite study, is the single largest study of its type in the world's literature, six months of more than 800 women treated with testosterone, but no estrogen, documenting the effects of testosterone can occur independent of, independent of giving a woman menopausal estrogen treatment. Now these are all menopausal women. One of the largest safety studies with over 48 months of treatment, over a thousand patient years of exposure, showed no clinically significant adverse effects of testosterone treatment on cholesterol, liver function, blood count, or carbohydrate metabolism. These are concerns of the regulators. It did show a small increase in body weight of almost two kilograms. That was highly statistically significant. But I'd also point, point out that muscle weighs more than fat, and these women noted a decrease in dress size. So they gained weight mostly as muscle, decreasing dress size. There was a small increase in blood pressure, which was statistically significant, but it was uh, less than two millimeters of mercury. And there were a few extra cases of breast cancer. This is important, but there were no added cases of breast cancer beyond what would ex one would expect for women being four years older. Remember that age is the number one risk for breast cancer. These findings led to a consensus document just last year. It was published simultaneously in four important medical journals, a endocrinology journal, a menopause journal, a sexual medicine journal, and an international sexual menopause and andropause journal. These journals all carried the same worldwide global consensus document which basically said that testosterone was good for sexual energy and function in postmenopausal women. I'd like to move on to flibanserin or ADDI. This was the first FDA approved product for women who were premenopausal with hypoactive sexual desire disorder. It was originally developed as an antidepressant, and it didn't work. It didn't work as an antidepressant. But like many drugs that were developed because of serendipity in science, seeing things through another lens, my favorite example is Viagra, which was developed as an antihypertensive drug but ended up, as you well know, being prescribed for erectile dysfunction. Well, flibanserin was a failed antidepressant, but in the depressant studies, it was found that women expressed an increased desire for sex and they were still clinically depressed. That would raise my interest also. So this medication, which has a very complicated mechanism of action described for you here, but I won't go through the details, was found to increase sexual desire in women who were not clinically depressed. And there was a huge development effort costing nearly a billion dollars to bring this product to market. In the three most important studies that were done on the product, 
flibanserin at 100 milligrams, the standard FDA approved dose, when given at bedtime, increased the number of satisfying sexual events, here called SSEs in the first column, increased sexual desire on a validated rating scale called the Female Sexual Function Index, or FSFI, in the middle panel, and decreased sexually related sexual distress in the last column. And it did so highly statistically significantly in nearly all cases by about the eight week time frame. You can see how uniform and consistent each and every one of these endpoints is. And each one of those lines represents somewhere between 300 and 500 individuals. When you look at this, as the FDA did, and as many critics of this medication did, they said, hmm, satisfying sexual events. Well, it looks like the placebo group here, which is the lower line in the upper right-hand corner and the first column, the placebo group, well, they're having sex about once a week, and the treatment with flibanserin only increased the number of sexual events a month by about one time. Is that really showing that a drug works? That it increases the number of times a woman has sex from about two a month to three a month, or one and a half a month to two and a half a month? How does that work? Am I supposed to really believe this medication is effective? Well, one needs to understand a couple things. First, placebo is a very potent medication, particularly for an endpoint like sex. It's why just about anything that the high school graduate at the GNC tells you will work for you for your sex drive will actually have an effect. There's a really good study, I won't show it to you, that shows that 40% of the effect of just about everything in sexual medicine is a placebo. But this is above placebo. So let's look at the placebo corrected rate of sexual events in women who were responders, that is to say, they responded to phlebanserin which is about 50% of that. So I'd like to point out the three sets of bars in each of these three panels. The gray bar or is the, or the smallest bar in each of these three panels is the placebo group. The orange bar, phlebanserin, which includes all of the women in all of the studies. And the tallest bar, what we would call the phlebanserin responders. And you can see that they're now having 5.7 sexual events a month. For the average 35 year old in a long term stable monogamous relationship, we would say that that's a return to normal. Having sex about six times a month probably sounds pretty good during a COVID epidemic, particularly for the women in these trials who were having sex about one and a half times a month at baseline. Well, what about phlebanserin in menopausal women? We studied about 500 women and gave them phlebanserin or matching placebo. They were average age 55.5 years. There was a mixture, but they were mostly Caucasian, some black and very few Asian women, some Hispanics. And they were in long-term stable monogamous relationships of about 12 years duration. Further, they had 
HSDD, no interest in sexual activity at all for about five years. Five years out of the 12 and a half that they had been partnered, that's a long time to have no interest in sex. And just having a good relationship at the end, because none of the women in these studies had a bad relationship by their, relation, by their admission, having no interest in sex for, let's say, half your relationship of 12 years, that's bound to put stress on, a, on an intimate relationship. Well, in them, the endpoints were nearly the same. The number of SSEs, satisfying sexual events, went up compared to placebo. Sexual desire went up compared to placebo. And sexually related distress went down statistically and significantly compared to placebo. Now, flibanserin has side effects as do all drugs. They are about 10% of women have dizziness. About 10% of women have somnolence or sleepiness. About 10% have nausea. Most of these are transient, but there are about 10% of women that have them. They include about 10% that have fatigue. Now these events mean that 90% of women did not have these events. So not very different than most medications that work in the central nervous system for a variety of ailments, including anxiety and depression. One of the hidden bonuses of flibanserin is that it's also associated with weight loss. It's associated with weight loss in both pre- and postmenopausal women, even though this is not included in the label. So a woman who can lose 10% of her body weight and increase her sexual desire, uh, that sounds pretty good to a lot of my patients. The newest kid on the block, I mentioned it previously, is bremelanotide. Bremelanotide is an injectable medication, and it has the advantage of it's given as desired, kind of like Viagra. When a man wants to have an erection, he takes his Viagra. In this case, when a woman wants to be interested in sex and has generalized hypoactive sexual desire disorder, she gives herself a little auto injection with this medication in a one-time use auto injector seen here. It's a little teeny needle injecting a very small amount of medication. And it's been shown to increase sexual desire. You can see it here in the pink bars, statistically and significantly increasing sexual desire and decreasing sexually related distress. It also improved satisfaction, orgasm, lubrication, and arousal. So not only does it improve desire, it also has a benefit downstream on lubrication, orgasm, and arousal. It has side effects too. About 40% of women in each of these trials complained of nausea. About a quarter of them had flushing of the face, and about 10% or so had a headache. Again, most of these side effects were described as being mild or moderate in severity, and many of them were transient, occurring primarily with the first dose of medication and decreasing with increased dosages. Well, what about Viagra, Levitra, Cialis, Stendra, et cetera, for women? Does that work in women? And the answer is yes, it works, but it was tested by their manufacturers largely for treating desire. And we know from what we've talked about that hypoactive sexual desire disorder, desire is in the brain. Arousal and orgasm is in the genitals. And these drugs are blood flow medication. But nonetheless, in selected groups of individuals, those that had, for example, delayed arousal and orgasm, or 
individuals that had decreased ability to achieve arousal and orgasm due to treatment with their antidepressant medication, their SSRIs or their SNRIs. This medication, in this case Viagra, so-called sildenafil, was used and could improve sexual function. So these drugs don't help desire, but they do help function in selected individuals. I want to mention vibrators. Now, vibrators are old products. They have been refined. New generation of technology has improved them but they basically stimulate the female genitals, and by the way, they work in men as well, to improve stimulation, arousal, and to help in achieving orgasm. They are widely used. About half of women and men, 18 to 60 years of age, have incorporated a vibrator in their solo or partnered sexual activities. About 51% of heterosexual couples, 70% of lesbian couples, and 80% of bisexual women have used the vibrator either alone or with a partner. And most vibrator users, 80% of heterosexuals, 100% of lesbians, and 64% of bisexual women felt that their partners somewhat or strongly like the fact that they used a vibrator. And these are from studies of nationally representative probability samples. Very hard to do, and these are very robust findings. But many women need added stimulation to achieve arousal and orgasm, particularly when they're past menopause, or if they're aging, because aging affects blood flow, nerve function, and nothing works as well when you're 70 as when you're 30. Believe me, I can tell you. So remember, pink and plump, we're talking about the genital tissues, not pale and frail, and don't forget, use it or lose it. Thank you very much, and have a great day.